Greeting, this is MBA 522, and this lecture is on decision-making biases. We've covered some of the basics of the decision-making process, as well as individual differences that are going to impact the way that we make decisions. What this lecture is going to focus on are the biases that every single one of us were, are going to fall for. I fall for them, you will as well. Sometimes we're better at sniffing out the biases in some situations than others, but we are still prone to them and sometimes we don't recognize, we recognize it until we're in the middle of it and we're looking back and go, oh no, how did I fall for that? So that's what we're gonna focus on today. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a good idea of the types of biases that you can expect to see. Um, and what we're going to try to do in this lecture is also talk about ways that we can think about how to overcome that. So the big question we often ask ourselves is, how did I fall for that? How did I get caught up in a decision bias, get caught up in an escalation of commitment to something? And the answer is because that's kind of how our brain works. We can be fooled by optical illusions. Um, and there just are many ways that we become prone to bias because of that, that perceptual process, because of the way that our brain organizes information and tries to keep things as simple and as straightforward as possible. And the bottom line is things are never as simple as our brain perceives them to be. And often the experiences we have in our life are the things that influence the way that we perceive things. So it is absolutely important. We remember that we're human beings. No one is immune. We are going to uh, uh, get caught up and, and we're going to hit those pitfalls more often than not. But here's the key. The key is we should be aware, we should train ourselves, and we need to be more mindful. We'll talk about mindfulness towards the end of this term, but the goal here for us is to make sure that we bring biases to our awareness. And once we bring them to our awareness, like anything else, we can't unthink it. And we will be more sensitive when we start to see a bias out there. It's, it's about training our brains to see things. So it is important that we recognize these, that we practice them, and then the simulation that you're going to do in this module is also about recognizing in the moment when we're engaging in uh, decision-making biases. Um, I expect you all to fall victim to those biases because I did as well. Um, it's also important to know that our, our biases that we tend to fall victim to as we're making decisions tend to overlap with each other they actually often work together. So if we have an overconfidence bias where we believe that we are 100% confident about something, it's usually also could be uh, tied in with a 2020 hindsight bias where our memories of something are based on what we're experiencing now, not what we knew at the time. So we're overconfident because we have this past hindsight memory, which we know is flawed. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we'll start to see some overlap between these decision biases. Um, the goal here is to try to make yourself aware as much as possible and to assume nothing and question everything. It's always better to ask questions rather than assume that you understand. And um, obviously it's about what kinds of questions to ask, but we want to make sure even if we're using the same language as somebody else, that we are asking questions to understand what someone else means by the terms that they use versus just assuming that you and I have the same understanding of how a word is used. So let's kick this off with talking about the overconfidence bias, as I've already referenced in the previous slide. We overestimate our confidence in our opinions and our decisions. It's a natural thing. Often when someone says, I'm 100% sure, or I'm 99% sure, usually they are outside of their comfort zone and they are trying to make themselves feel like they know more than they really do. So this is how we reinforce it with ourselves. We engage in that behavior because it helps us feel comfortable with ourselves. The more comfortable and knowledgeable we are, in reality, the more likely we are to have more 
realistic estimates where I might say, well, I'm probably 85% sure that's going to happen, but I also know that there are situations where it might not happen. So just because I'm 85% aware doesn't mean that 100% of the time I'm right and I'm acknowledging that I might not be right. And I think that's the challenge. People with egos and people who lead with egos are always saying, I know everything and I don't make mistakes and I am superior and I am 100% sure this is what's going to happen. When in reality, there are all sorts of variables that we can't control or may not be aware of that are going to influence how things happen. So why do we end up with this overconfidence bias? As I said, sometimes we have this illusion of superiority where we believe that we are better than other people, maybe because of our education or because we have experience with some things. And honestly, yes, of course, we do have some experience with things that creates a situation where we um, may be more knowledgeable. But again, there's a difference between being knowledgeable and recognizing that there might be cracks in our knowledge and this belief that 100% I'm always right and everybody else is always wrong. That illusion of superiority comes from a host of insecurities and things like that. It also comes from the fact that we believe that we can control random events and, and we can't. And that is also another decision making bias, not being able to recognize when something is random. So again, we want to be aware that there's no such thing as lucky underwear. There's no such thing as your lucky bat when you're playing baseball. It might give us comfort, but there's nothing inherent in that underwear or socks or baseball bat or whatever it is that are, are going to have an impact on an outcome because random things are random things and they aren't going to have a direct impact on that. The other reason why we get overconfident is because of, of the bounded rationality that we talked about in that very first lecture. The idea that we have a limited ability to understand and know all the possible outcomes. We can't possibly know them. And because we can't possibly know them, there's no way that we're going to be 100% confident that something is going to happen. Um, so we want to be very careful in the language that we use when we're communicating with people um, to be sure that we understand things. The other issue and where overconfidence comes from is because when we engage in um, doing research, often we search for the confirming evidence and we don't search for disconfirming evidence. So this is what we call a confirmation bias, where my search for information is based on proving me right rather than seeking information to prove me wrong. And that is uh, part of our uh, a challenge that, that a lot of people have because they don't really know how to do good research um, in terms of really understanding something in depth. So they do a surface search. They, um, uh, they get confirmation in, of information that only reinforces their views and they never look for the stuff that proves them wrong. Lastly is that hindsight bias that we talked about. We're really good at remembering our successes and we are really, really good at forgetting our failures. So it is important that we try to keep track of when we were successful and when we were not successful, when we were right and when we were wrong, because that is going to give us more accuracy in our ability to estimate what is a realistic outcome for something. The next bias we're going to talk about is inertia bias. And inertia bias is essentially procrastination and the different reasons why we procrastinate. Often we procrastinate because of a, what we call analysis paralysis, where we have gathered so much information that we are absolutely paralyzed in our ability to move forward because our frontal cortex, our prefrontal cortex, which handles decision making, is hijacked because it only handles five to seven pieces of information at a time. And when we are bombarding it with a ton of information, it paralyzes us in our ability to make a decision. So we to relieve the stress that we feel because of that paralysis, we put off the decision. Of course, we all know, right, putting off a decision 
may give you temporary relief, but ultimately it comes back to bite you. And we do need to make the decision one way or the other. So we have to kind of overcome the the paralysis to be able to make it work. Um, so sometimes it's about conflict avoidance. We don't want to make that decision either because we're overwhelmed or because, um, um, you know, we're just frustrated and, and just too much information or it's just too much conflict for us to deal with. The other thing is it's about un avoiding unpleasantness. So if a process or a short-term outcome is unpleasant, we put it off. You know, we figure, oh, it's fine, even if the long-term goal is fine. But if we believe that the short-term process is going to be unpleasant, it's far more likely for us to just say, nope, not going to do it, not going to go there. So inertia bias, the way that we can help to overcome inertia bias is truly to sometimes lean in when we feel that discomfort. And often we anticipate something to be un more unpleasant than it really is. Uh, but we still need to go through it. And I think if you if you think about different ways in which we can set priorities in our life, the one of the um, the one of the joking ways that I've I've learned about how to make it um, uh, to get over inertia bias is what we call eating a frog. And what the argument is behind the eating a frog analogy is we start our day and we eat the frog. We do the thing that is the most unpleasant that we have no interest in doing. We get it done. We get it out of the way. That relief is a reward in of itself, and that enables us to have a clear slate to do the other things that we want to do during the day. So I always even try to tell my kids, right, the goal is for us to dive in and to do the thing that's really hard first. And then once you get that hard thing done, the rest of the day is yours to do the things that make you happy. So this is one of the ways we can try to mentally think about how do we overcome inertia bias. Immediate gratification is sort of the opposite of the inertia bias or the procrastination bias. And what it means is we don't have a sense of self-control, that we have a very short-term need to gratify ourselves. We don't look forward more than in the immediate term. And so anything long-term impact, we blow it off and we don't care. Um, we seek immediate rewards and we don't delay our gratification. This is a problem that we see in industry where organizations are more concerned about their quarterly reporting and what their quarterly reports look like rather than the investment in the long term for something. Now, we also have to be careful with balancing long term investment and escalation of commitment, right? Because if we're investing in something for the long term, that's great, but then we can also be prone to an escalation commitment by it, which we will talk about in a few more slides. But I think it's important for us to to acknowledge that it's easy for us to get caught up in what I need right now. We do this when we're feeling stressed out. It's easy for us to engage in immediate gratification. And again, it almost comes from the same problem, which is our brain is hijacked. Our brain doesn't have the capacity to exert self-control to be able to make a decision about deferred gratification. I'm sure you've probably heard the psychological experiments about the marshmallow, where they put a marshmallow in front of a child and they tell them that they, that they, that if they don't eat the marshmallow, when the researcher comes back in the room, they can have two marshmallows and they'll be able to eat them. But if they, if they decide to eat the marshmallow, then they won't get another marshmallow. So we see in that moment which kids are capable of dealing with self-control and immediate gratification in which kids can't. Um, and that gives us some insight into whether or not they're struggling with things like ADHD, where there's impulse control problems. Um, so there's all sorts of psychology things behind this. But for our purposes, for business decisions, we have to recognize that the frontal cortex, when it is hijacked, when it is filled with a ton of information, we are not able to make deferred uh, gratification decisions, we're more likely to just jump in and do whatever it pleases us now because that's the path of least resistance. It's easier that way. Um, and again, we have to figure out how do we minimize the overload in our frontal cortex to clear it up so we're able to make really good decisions. And so stress management is a good way to think about this. How do we manage our stress? How do we make sure that our um, 
um, our stressors are being managed, that our resting stress is at a reasonable level and it's low key. So things to be thinking about.